Hello, everyone. Hi. Welcome <laughs> to our webinar where we're talking about summer reading programming for the Adventure Begins at Your Library uh, theme. My name is Brianna. My name is Daisy. And more about us. So <laughs> my name is Bri. I'm the current Young Adult Services Librarian at the Starkville Public Library. I am currently a meteorology student. However, I've been a library since 2018. I love programming all things library. And my fashion icon is Miss Frizzle, and the fit today is a short dress. It's kind of hard to see. Um, I personally think nothing is too spicy. I love me some spicy food. And one of the reasons I love this demographic, tweens and teens, is that I think they are the funniest people ever. If you've ever been to a tween or teen program, you'll hear the craziest, funniest stuff you've heard in your entire life. And then also... Wait, oh, I have a question. What's your question, Daisy? What? what tweens, middle graders, what's... What's the, so this is kind of going into what your library wants, what your patrons want. So my demographic of tweens or middle schoolers, they're the same thing, the same age range, the same group. My demographic, however, does not mind being called tween. So I just address them as tween, it's easier to say middle grade, but your library might be different. So, and so I call them my in-betweeners, in-between children and teens. They like it. They think it's funny. They like a good pun. And like every librarian I have ever met, I love cats and I have a cat. And what librarian doesn't have a cat? I don't. Hi, I'm this is Yomara Martinez and Steve, and I was the former young adult services librarian. And I just love interacting with the public and doing outreach a little too much. And so <laughs> I requested to move to Circulation Desk, but I also knew that the teen programming um, and Y services was gonna be in great hands with Bree. She's doing a phenomenal job. And as far as well, my time in YA services, the thing I'm most proud of um, is the Teen Advisory Board because that, I don't know, it just made my heart happy that I was able to get teens in um, and they were able to give me their input. And it was just a fun time. And we'll talk about Teen Advisory Boards mm -hmm. later. Um, I love Hot Cheeto Funyuns. They're my most favorite hot chip of all time. I want a blue ribbon at mascot camp. And I bring this up at every job interview I've ever had. Thank you. And and also December 18th, 2022 will forever be my most favorite date in the world because that is when Lionel Messi won the World Cup. And that is all you need to know about me. <laughs> exactly. Moving on. So the things we'll be discussing in this webinar, mm -hmm. we'll be talking about the prep work with summer reading. I feel like a lot of the materials that we've seen about summer reading are all like, these are really cool program ideas, but we need to start with like the basics of how we should plan and implement. Then we'll talk about our program ideas and inspirations. And then we'll go over some topical middle grade and young adult book recommendations. But before we get started, we need to give you a reminder. You need to keep in mind, and the hand is freaking me out, but that <laughs> you are amazing, incredible, brilliant, resilient, tough, hardworking. You are, are so many great things. And I feel like a lot of times in libraries, we, especially with social media, we compare ourselves to others, compare our programs. That library got more teens than I did. That this, why are they having more fun or more success? And we just need to tell you to stop that um, because you are the expert in your community, in your library. You do so much for the community and you need to know how valued and important you are. And so we, before we talk anything about today, we just wanted to make sure that you knew that you're amazing and please don't compare yourself to others because you are wonderful just the way you are. And thank Thank you for everything that you do for your library and your teens and middle graders and show yes and so now we have to talk about how to get the teens in so a teen summer probably said where are the snacks working with teens you know that teens teen programming and snacks go hand in hand so let's talk about how we work with that demographic so one important thing is learning how to work with teens and middle graders. And I personally found, and I'm sure Daisy can attest to this, that working with that demographic, those two age groups, pretty much the same. So first of all, don't take things personally. If you remember yourself as a teen or a middle grader, like I remember myself as a teen or middle grader, I was super moody. I, it was an awkward time in my life. I didn't really know who I was. And just don't take what they do or what they say super personally. Another thing we need to keep in mind is be flexible. Their interests change. They might come to a program and realize they want to do the passive stuff you have on the shelf. So be flexible, really encourage that. And another thing, they love when the teen librarian is excited. So be excited about things. 
However, there is like a point where you have to know when not to be excited because you don't want to come across as crazy yeah. or uncool. Crazy, no. Yeah. <laughs> prep work yes yeah because sometimes that would be cringy just kind of feel out the teens and the vibes and the middle mm-hmm. graders because there are teens that walk in here I'm like oh okay they're cool I just gotta remain calm um my oh my gosh my first summer reading program experience time I was overwhelmed I wasn't sure what I was doing thankfully I had Brie um she gave me notes and tips from what the library did in the previous summer, because coming in, I didn't want to change things completely, but I did want to keep some of the same elements that I thought uh, worked well. And just getting feedback from teens, that, that was the main thing. But how I personally did prep work was I am a dreamer. I love to dream big because then I get inspired and excited. And once I'm inspired and excited, that motivates me to do all the other things. So I would dream and brainstorm like, you know, big, what what could possibly be done? Um, And then you have to identify the doable because budgets aren't (laughs) what we would want them to be and and other things, materials, we don't have like bajillion square feet of space. Um, So identifying the doable um, and also what feedback are you getting from teams and what materials we can purchase and or make because DIY is the best thing ever. I'll talk about it more later, but um, also just looking around, what does your library own already have? Uh, cardboard and other supplies because that really helps with summer programming um, and getting inspiration and ideas. Definitely involving the teens more. Like once you like narrowed it down to the doable things, you can like incorporate teens, like get their input and advice on how to improve their program um, and get them to get some have some buy-in uh, and then ta-da you know it's like summer reading and it's crazy and awesome and fun but I know all brains work differently so that's my brain and this is yes. Bree's brain my brain I am a researcher I am a planner I like things down to a T so I think that identifying how you go about your library planning especially before summer reading because when summer reading mm-hmm. happens it's kind of game over at that point you need to like focus on the droves of teens or middle graders that are coming into your program so like ahead of time, I will plan and program. I'll use, I'll work with my brain and not against my brain to make sure that I'm making programs that I know I can do that are realistic. Like Daisy said, identify the doable. And that's how I approach my summer reading planning. So I think that we talk a lot about doing the cool programs and like talk about the cool programs we're doing, but we need to kind of like take a step back and identify this is how I need to do it. And really familiarize yourself, yourself with how you plan and how Daisy might plan is different from how I would plan. Yes. And that is also another reason that I love going to Brie or having someone at work or at the library that you can bounce ideas off of because her brain, our brains work differently, but also when she gets excited, I get excited Mm -hmm. and it just really helps keep you motivated and pumped up. But I know not every library has um, multiple people working with like youth, uh, young adults. So even it, just find a coworker that you can speak with or a family member or a friend, because I think it's important to find that support system or network and get get yourself a hype person. That's what Except we recommend. Because getting a hype person. And then while you're doing the prep work in order to get excited and get involvement, and even if you don't have a coworker like I have with Daisy that I can bounce ideas off of, you can have a teen advisory board. Teen advisory boards, they are wonderful and amazing. And how we initially get the teens in first is snacks and uh, volunteer service hours. Because we did some research, the schools around here, uh, teens are required to have a certain amount of hours before they graduate. And teen advisory board, it's an hour once a month of them coming in and giving us input on how we can improve uh, services and programs geared towards them. And also they can choose to be involved more throughout the month. But I think it's easy to ask for an hour a month because they are very busy. Mm -hmm. And so we've had to fine tune and select what times and stuff works best for them. Um, And we want them to be able to like help us plan. We want them to create and serve and socialize. Um, And when we were talking about being flexible, I know like my first 
time meeting, I had like an idea of what we were going to talk about. I had the little agenda and everything printed out, but then they just wanted to talk because they were meeting each other for the first time. They wanted to talk about other things. And I went with the flow because that's just how it goes. Um, so it's a great way to get teams involved in helping out with summer reading. Exactly. And then they have that buy-in of like, I helped plan this. So mm -hmm. I'm just going to go to it as well and like see their efforts have been rewarded. So now that we've talked about all the prep work, let's launch into the programming section that you guys, this is probably my favorite part of all the webinars I've seen of summer reading. So the way we formatted this section is that we kind of bookend our big programs with like the middle graders and we'll talk about the smaller programs. And then Daisy will talk about her really big programs. So my first thing I'm talking about that gets the tweens, middle graders in the door, especially your boys, is a program I've done about four times now. Every time has been a massive success. I call it Roblox After Hours. The basic setup is that I download Roblox on our Patreon computers. And then on Friday after we're closed, they'll come in and we'll just have a Roblox gaming party. It's very reminiscent of the early 90s with the LAN parties. So just some pictures of how I go about it. So as you can see on this top left picture, it's me talking to all the all the tweens at the table. So when they come in, I have a presentation that's just a very silly summarization of all the rules that we need to abide by. They don't like to be, they don't like to sit and hear boring rules. So I just make it silly and add fun pictures. And the thing is, even though they're laughing and having a good time, they will remember it because I've seen things happen and the kid's like, hey, Miss Bree told you not to do that. Be, don't be that guy. And so th that gives them a chance to also meet each other for the first time. And I'll, I'll sometimes give them snacks. Now in this bottom left picture, it's a picture of all of them at their respective computers playing a game together. And an important note that I think that anyone who tries to emulate this program should do, I'm at the end playing with them. So it's a really great way to get to know the tweens or middle graders and also for them to kind of associate you with a fun person. And I feel like when they see you as a fun person, also an adult figure, but still a fun person, it builds that relationship, that rapport, and it gets them back in the library. And then as you can see in this rightmost picture, it's just them playing together. One of my tweens is excited that he won something. So I've seen a lot of friendships blossom in this program. And it's just such a fun way to get them in the door and just have fun at the library. So my big thing is getting them to associate the library with fun. And just some pointers about the Roblox After Hour programs. It is a great way to get your boys in. I know that a lot of libraries, when I've communicated with other librarians from even different states, there tends to be a drop off between like little boys coming to children's program and then they just don't come to any more library programs. And it's such a hard demographic to reach. Getting them in for Roblox is a great way to not only reach them, but like I said earlier, have them associate the library with fun. And I feel like they'll be more receptive to coming to more library programs mm -hmm. if they're like, oh, the library has really cool programs that are relevant to my interest. Another thing that I love about this program is that it's so versatile and so easy to do. You just need some patron computers. I prefer doing it after hours. There are some libraries that do it virtually, that do it during library time, but just kind of section off some patron computers that are just for Roblox. And it's versatile in the way that there are so many games available for free on Roblox that they can play together. They can be educational or they can just be outright fun related to their current interests. It's also relatively inexpensive. The way I do it personally is that I have everyone on one private server. So sometimes you have to purchase the private server, but it's typically like one or two dollars. And that ensures that they are only playing with people that are at the program is just to keep the parents okay with them coming to the program that they're not talking to internet strangers and then also roblox doesn't need a fancy gaming computer to run it just needs pretty much basic hardware that most libraries have with their basic patron computers so i found mass success with this with my tweens and middle graders and hopefully if you need to if you want to replicate this then i have my email at the end of the presentation. So now more programs. More programs. So um, when we talk about getting teen buy-in, teen involvement in, uh, murder mystery parties, those are fun. Um, and teens have, sometimes I wonder if more fun like planning it than <laughs> not. Um, because 
murder mystery. There are lots of like pre-built games online or you can make your own. And I'm kind of a fan of making my own. Um, so what I did is like, my friend had already had a murdering mystery game and I just took it, the structure. And then I called a meeting with the teens. It was teen advisory board, but they could bring friends and everyone like that. We literally just sat around the bean bags and the chairs and tables. And I said, all right, everyone come up with characters. And then they start shouting like ideas and funny things. Like, all right, come up with character characters characteristics and then they were like oh there's a man and he talks to his invisible parrot every seven minutes you know just the the randomness that comes from their minds I love it so much and um and then for some reason they really love talking about murder weapons so <laughs> that was um interesting and it was fun um but honestly I had more fun with that like planning session than I thought I would um and yeah and everything else the structures the plans like you can reach out to us afterwards if you have questions and whatnot. But Murder Mysteries are great. Clue had a team bring in her Clue game and we just base it off of that or you know, the pre-built games online. But definitely if you want to involve the teens, let them be creative with the characters and the props and things like that. So, yes. And then another idea of uh, a creative like crafty program is based on the vacation tile coasters program that's already in the manual and I have the page number. However, I thought this has so much potential. Let's expand it. Let's, I love the theme because it's so broad. So let's expand it to don't just make vacation tile coasters with like collages of cars and road trips. Let's expand to fictional wor worlds. Like for example, on the right, that picture are Perler coasters of the mana symbols in the card game, magic, the gathering. And I love that card game. And just it it gets those who might not be interested in just making a collage tile coaster and being like hey we have further beads you can make a star wars coaster or you can make a minecraft coaster it just the possibilities are endless mm -hmm. with that one and also it's just something for them to take home and use it's very useful yes. the next suggestion for programs we have this is a little more broad but just a suggestion that we both think goes really well with the theme mm -hmm. are ttrpgs or tabletop role-playing games now you can be as involved as you want, or you can have through teen advisory board or just general interest in your community, you can have a teen be in charge of being the game master, the dungeon match master, and they can build the world with potentially other teens or even middle graders. You can, again, the possibilities are endless. I do recommend, however, just not to overload yourself or the teen that wants to pursue being a a GM or a DM is I recommend having registration. I know sometimes that's, that seems like an obstacle that you don't want to have. Mm -hmm. However, because of just how, again, how involved and complicated it can be, knowing how many to expect, I feel like registration is important. Mm -hmm. Another great aspect about this is that there are so many already available pre-built games. If you're, if it seems very intimidating, you don't want to have to create your own. There's so many um, pre-built games for different franchises and fandoms. And so gauge what your population mm -hmm. likes doing. And you can probably find either an official TTRPG online or a fan-made one. And the fan-made ones I found are just as good, if not better than the ones you can buy from the company that creates the program. For example, I found this great Pokemon role-playing game. It has like a 400-page player manual. It's insane. And it's all fan-made, but it's amazing. And have so many people that want Pokemon, so I might have to do that for me also avatar last airbender is still very popular and relevant with our, at least our demographic <laughs> exactly we love avatar and us and us <laughs> we're big nerds and then also for the middle graders wings of fire still a very popular franchise about dragons and dragons are cool and i have linked in the resources a fan-made uh role-playing game for wings of fire and i believe i also did the pokemon one Ooh. And so moving on to different types of programs, so Starkville Selfies, but insert the city you're from, um, it's like a community scavenger hunt. And you can, because that's another thing I love Teen Advisory Board is it exists, but you also get to know the teens. And then when you notice that they have a skill or an interest, you can promote them, like, or you can empower them to like, hey, create a scavenger hunt. We had a team create one for like Christmas. It was around town and it was brilliant and wonderful. And so for this one specifically, um, I think it'd be cool. You can depend how different you want to do it, but you could ask businesses if you could leave um, 
like for example a little or something random like a capybara like at their business or whatever and then you ask the teens to take selfies with the capybara at this location that location it could be restaurants or if you want to highlight awesome community organizations that are doing great work and it's just another way for teens to find out like the Humane Society is always a great one. We like in Starkville, we have Starkville Strong. They work um, with feeding people and helping keep them homes and um, lots of opportunities to grow and learn about things, but in a, a fun way, or you could literally just put capybaras in random places and take selfies with them. Um, and it ties in like with the community adventure game, the manual, page 173. Um, but also adventure could literally happen anywhere. But we are very fortunate to live in a college town where we have a lot of international families. And so I think that it's amazing to always try and incorporate different cultures and um, regions outside of where you are so teens can be exposed to that because it's important to learn about other cultures and around the world. And for example, my mom is from El Salvador and like, hey, let's make pupusas. It's very simple. I have made uh, tortillas with, uh, oh, what were they? Like middle graders before. It was a little hectic, but it was awesome because all it involved was water and flour. And we just, I don't let them touch the hot stuff. But at the same time, talking about that country, the region, fun facts, it was just fun. And so partnering like with the university or other community organizations around you, I think would be very, very important. Um, and you could also have teens talk about their culture because there was a team that would come to teen advisory board and she isn't she was like interested in Korea like well because she was born there obviously <laughs> and so she wanted to start a Korean club and it was a way for her to talk about cultural elements uh, favorite foods and it's been really great so again empowering teens like encouraging them to maybe do a little more than they thought that they could. And then you could also do the Taiwan adventure on page 49. I feel like a commercial. Back to you. Thank you, Daisy. So another aspect is kind of an offshoot of the travel to that would be a little more approachable if you don't have like the ingredient or the supplies to get the food program going, or maybe not even the budget. Cause sometimes mm -hmm. like we struggle with the budget mm -hmm. as well. You can do instead an around the world that can be either a one-time program or a series of programs. When I did it for a kickoff party for when I was the children's services assistant, I had a different station for each continent and each station had like a craft relevant to a major celebration or cultural practice in that respective continent. So you can, you can either do it as like a big one-time program where they can go around and learn about different cultures and different regions of the world, or you can make it a series of programs where maybe once a week um, during summer reading, you highlight a country and then learn about it through a craft for those who might be a little more artsy than foodies. And I think this is a great way to tie in books for a display relative to like, for example, you're in Japan that week and you're making crafts relevant to the country of Japan. You can have a, a display with um, books about Japan, with books that from authors about Japan or just set in Japan. I think there's the possibilities are endless mm -hmm. with that one. Yes. Yes. And another cool thing, I think it's a time capsule is like capturing a moment in time for teens young adults especially now because social media is a big thing they're putting their lives on social media or some of them not all of them and I think this is a really great thing to just stop for a moment reflect and think what um, items could you put in the time capsule and even encouraging them to write a little note to themselves from the future um, and can we talk about this like <laughs> if you want to bury it at your library definitely check for a permit this is why brain's brain is great she thinks of these things I, i'm just like we'll just bury it in someone's backyard you know it's like cool with us doing it um but definitely if you want to um do one in your library and you don't even have to bury it you could just keep it in a locked box and put don't open until 2034 or something like that um and it's just a fun way especially if you want to get them like writing and getting away from their phones. Mm -hmm. so. Exactly. Now, speaking about getting them writing and away from their phones, I thought that a perfect, or we thought that a perfect way to really engage their creative, like get the creative juices flowing would be having some creative writing activities or programs. So I think that the library is a perfect place for middle graders, tweens, teens to learn about a new hobby or engage in their current hobbies. Mm -hmm. 
and find peers that like to do the same. So some possibilities for a creative writing activity during summer reading is that they come in maybe weekly, every other week, and you provide a prompt and they write and you give them a time limit. And then at the end, they can share their work if they want. And that's more like flash fiction. Or you can do it alternatively where you all come together and come up with one centric plot and everyone writes kind of off offshoots that have to do with that one plot. This is reminiscent of a pro of a of a an assignment I had in high school that I loved. The teacher gave us one plot. We all had characters that were dealing with this plot. And at the end, she printed off everyone's papers, put them in a book and gave each of us a copy of it. So if that's something also you would like to do at the end of the summer, it's like, here's a reward of all of your writings and everyone else's writings in this one book. I, I loved that. And maybe your teens would love that. Tweens or teens would love that as well. An offshoot of kind of the creative writing to be a little more specific is choose your own adventure. And it's um, coming from the program in the manual that's choose your adventure. The one in the manual has it to where it's on a board and it's written. This one, I took more of a technological approach to make it easier to share and have everyone have their own input in their own. So have tweens or teens to use Google Forms or a program I love called Twine. And I have resources and tutorials for the that in the resources for this uh, program or for the sorry presentation. And you can have several sessions where they work on their stories, they create their stories, and then maybe at the end, you provide links or files of everyone's that everyone else can play. And you can talk about what they liked about, which one was their favorite. And it's just a great way to get tweens and teens to write, to express their hobbies, and to really give each other feedback and work together. Another great thing, and I've done this before for the eclipse we had back in October, we did a solar oven recipe contest, and this is based on the programming manual. However, I want to include that use that Mississippi heat to your advantage. It gets so hot in the summer, and it's perfect for solar ovens. So one thing that I did when we previously did a solar oven program is that I asked for donated pizza boxes from our local pizza place. And I had, I'm not one to ask for donations. I'm, I'm worried about that. However, however, it was super simple. Just call the local pizza place, ask them, Hey, can we get, get, can I borrow like 20 or 30 pizza boxes? He's like, let me give you 50. So don't be afraid to reach out to local businesses. They love helping the library, or at least I found. And another um, part of the resources is I provided the Starnet document. So specifically the solar oven instructions that were for the Eclipse programming. However, their instructions I found are really good. They have pictures and also they have recipes included, not just s'mores, but they have like quesadillas. And so there's a lot of options with that as well. Another kind of sciencey program, I know that we want to incorporate science into our program as much as possible, are paper circuits. And that was discussed in the programming manual as well. However, again, I think that these programs can be adapted to fit our theme adventure begins at, with your library and you can customize the object that lights up. And one I found that was amazing were lightsabers. Make your own paper circuit card with a light up lightsaber. It's perfect and it's fun. And it's just a cool trick to press a button and your lightsaber lights up. And with a science program, sometimes the cost can, with when I plan science programs, sometimes the cost seems a little more insurmountable because some of the equipment is really expensive. With paper circuits, it's pretty inexpensive. So a perfect science program idea. And the last one I have for like the science and the art kind of mixed together is the glow in the dark paint along. Now alternatives I have is that instead of buying your own glow in the dark paint, you can create your own glow in the dark paint. There are several tutorials, useful tutorials I found online that make it relatively inexpensive because if you looked at the Amazon listings for glow in the dark paint, it's very expensive. Another suggestion I had if you host one is to incorporate black light bulbs if you can. It really adds another sensory experience because they're seeing it glow in the dark. It's so, it's so cool, like in real time. 
And what I am doing when I'm incorporating this program into my teen summer reading is I'm going to be having them follow a YouTube tutorial that is like a campfire and, and stuff. And they'll be using the glow in the dark paint as like accentuating pieces like the fire and the stars. And I thought that would that is a really cool visual to sum up the summer reading theme. Now in the programming manual, I'm kind of, I wanted to make this as a note. It says that to use like a Bob Ross follow along video. I have done that in my previous library and we got in trouble with the Bob Ross estate company, not entirely short sure, conglomerate. According to their website, you have to hire a licensed Bob Ross painter and teacher to host the event if you're using Bob Ross in your promotional material. So just like a little warning, if you, if you don't advertise it, you can probably use the Bob Ross tutorial, but just wanting to warn you guys before you get overzealous and want to do that. But again, it's a great idea. Another aspect, again, I love having tweens and teens engage in their respective hobbies. Incorporate card games. It's such a great way for tweens and teens, again, to not only engage with their hobbies or learn a new hobby, but to also socialize and problem solving. A lot of card games. The, the big three, Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh!, Magic the Gathering. Those have really big fan bases. You probably have local tournaments at your local card shop or game store that would totally be willing, willing to collaborate with you to either host a program or tournament or provide supplies. However, there is an amazing company that's a nonprofit that encourages like literacy through playing games and card games. It's called Magic Kids. And I received a box of hundreds of magic cards, a lot of magic cards, uh, card boxes, dice, supplies, all for free. The only expectation they have, and it, it's such a yeah. doable <laughs> expectation, is they want you to use it and implement it for programs and to let kids, tweens, teens, take it home with them so they can practice at home. And again, they, they can supply enough cards where you can totally do that. Another thing I thought fit perfectly with this theme is any sort of Minecraft program because Minecraft again super big with the tweens and teens still relevant I know I was playing in high school it's still people in high school are still playing it so I think implementing it doesn't have to be super massive but implementing maybe a scavenger hunt around the library can, with Minecraft imagery or with um, riddles about Minecraft would be a great idea um if you want to even expand it into having them come to the library to play Minecraft, similar to my Roblox after hours, I'm doing in March and later in March, I'm doing a couple of Minecraft programs where they come in and play Minecraft. And if you have any questions about that, again, you can contact us with any of any of those. And another thing for those who maybe not don't want to play the, the game, they can make crafts with it. And one of the crafts I found was this cool Minecraft torch. And it's super simple. There's actually a tea light in it that will glow when you have it on. Mine, mine is currently dead. <laughs> but it's such a cool thing for them to take home and visualize. And it's just so simple to make. Last but not least for this one, I, I am a fan of the Programming Librarian website. And this was something that was really big on their website a few months ago that I thought was perfect for the theme. It's a life-size Oregon Trail simulator. It's a little more intensive a project. Uh, they said the budget was actually not very expensive because they used a lot of uh, recycled materials that da like Daisy does with her escape rooms, but it's a little bit of a bigger scale. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it posed as a fun challenge for tweens or teens. Um, not only are you teaching them history in a fun way that they won't even recognize at that point, but you're also teaching them resource management. Essentially, the program is emulating the entire Oregon Trail game. They can run into problems crossing the river or one of their ox dies. So I thought it was a great way to bring that beloved game to life. And also you're not limited to just tweens or teens with this. If you want to involve other um, members of your library staff that do more adult program, you can make it a family program. So I think with the life, the life size Oregon Trail Simulator, the possibilities are indeed endless, but Ahora vamos a hablar sobre cuartos. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, Are you no. paying attention? Hopefully. <laughs> like, 
what is that? So um, what is an escape room? All right, when I first started working here and I was tasked with bringing teens in, I thought to myself, how the heck am I going to do that? Um, and at the time, Stranger Things season four had come out, Kate Bush with her lovely song. Um, and it, oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this is so max from stranger things season four so i watched that show and i thought it was amazing also my now fiance at the time took me to my very first escape room so i think it was a culmination of stranger things being so big like on tiktok and social media and then me just having experienced my first escape room i'm like i think this is something teens would like and thankfully it worked and i was scared at first that i wasn't going to be allowed to have it because i was new i was like what is allowed at libraries and so i love that Bree said bring it for roblox it's like you bring in kids and or teens middle graders just so they can associate the library with fun things and it's like wow i, I just really love that and so um what is an escape room it's a game it's a team of players. They discover clues. They solve puzzles, accomplish tasks. Um, they try to get out in a limited amount of time. Um, and usually like the professional escape rooms cost a lot of money to participate, especially if you have multiple people, big families. And our escape rooms are free, obviously. Mm -hmm. Like all of our library programs are free. But a lot of times people don't know that. And, um, and I know libraries all don't have a dedicated teen space or teen room. And so uh, we are very fortunate that we have the former law library is now the teen room. And I think that shows how much we value young people yes. and that's great. But also other libraries, if you don't have a room like that you could do an escape room in, it's fine if you just use a corner of a place or something. We, um, uh, it, because I thought that I have to have all these fancy things to make the escape room experience um, enjoyable for people. But the only things you need is a timer and very stressful music. And that <laughs> will make people feel like they really can't escape. Because I was scared that they were going to say, this is just a plastic curtain. I can just walk out. No, if you like, if you show excitement um, and they will feed off of that. And then it's just a really great time. So um, like where to begin with escape rooms? This is probably the only thing I did a ton of research on because Brie knows. I'm just like, let's just go with the flow. I'm going to wing it. Um, And it was a lot of research. I want, they were great, like, um, you know, YouTube tutorials and, and programming librarian, all of those things. That's been really great. But I think I love being able to talk to other librarians that have done escape rooms. Um, And so for me personally, I think... Um, choose your theme first because I want you to be excited about it and um, I know we try and pick things that teens and middle graders are excited about but I feel like if you're in this position in this job you're gonna like a lot of the things that teens and middle graders get excited about so get excited about your theme because again that'll motivate you and excite you I love like coming to Brie like hey let's talk this and hash out like because yes. oh we just get so excited <laughs> um choose your space. Like I said, not everyone has a room, but um, you can get some cheap, I keep looking over here because that's where our curtains are, <laughs> the cheap plastic tablecloths. I got a team to hole punch a bunch of holes at the top, <laughs> ran some and double-sided double it with uh, tape. And then we ran a string through it and just use command hooks to like put it on the wall to section off a corner of the teen room specifically for this and it's really great and, and um there are like pictures in the resources file um and also decide how many locks and boxes will be needed so how um escape rooms work um you're trying to you have to figure out the goal of escape room is it to find a key to find a cassette tape and you can put the cassette tape in a box that locks and the key to that box is in another box. So it's like you have to solve one, unlock one box to get the other one, or you could just leave a bunch of clues and different locks around the room and you solve each lock individually. Um, again, we can discuss more and talk more if you want help how to brainstorm that, but there are different ways to do things. That's, I guess, the main idea I'm throwing out here. Um, and whew, all right, so starter supplies for your very first dream if you want to venture off into this. I really think this is a great um, event program for teens, middle graders, um, because Adventure Begins at your library, and it's just, this is so great because the possibilities are endless. Um, so 
To the left, we have the breakout EDU kits, and I'm, maybe some of y'all have heard of them, and it's really cool. Um, they provide you with the boxes, with the basic supplies, locks, die, like puzzles, cards, everything. The only thing I didn't like was the, <laughs> it was $129 last time I checked on the website. Um, if you're a bigger library that can afford that, go for it. It saves you time. The online resources that Breakout EDU offers, um, they give you like escape rooms and it's it's just easier, right? If you're overwhelmed, have a lot and you also have the budget, go for it or plead to your director. Like, um, because this is a great resource to have uh, personally. Um, but I, again, like to challenge myself and I like to um, try and be creative and um, it's just fun working with teens in escape rooms as well. I just started out with simple supplies. Uh, at the time, I spent a little less than $44 inflation, am I right? But um, it's just, it was $44 for all of these supplies that I'm talking about here because what you need is just a box that you can like latch on this thing to. It's called a hasp lock. And it has these holes where you can put the locks. This is like your best friend. Um, and it wasn't that expensive on Amazon. And then just, I love our um, children's librarian. Her name is Miss Rainey. She's told me, tell everyone about everything, about what you're doing at the library. Because your patrons can be so generous and so kind. And, and if you tell them that, oh, I'm working on an escape room, I need this or that, they will come and drop off like a lockbox or a lock. And, and it's really amazing. So like Bree was talking about asking for donations for the pizza boxes, do that. Like, cause you'll be surprised like um, how generous people can be. And so I also looked around the library and I found this disc lock, this disc lock with the keys. Um, that's really helpful. But also one of these locks would be really, really great. It's a word lock. It's four uh, letter words. Um, and this has seen quite a bit of people. I would recommend if you can invest in like a good lock in the beginning. I did end up buying these cheap three digit locks, but after a hundred uses, it broke. I had to get a woman to come in with her pliers to cut it off the box. Um, so if you can invest in like master lock, uh, those are really good. But if you're starting out, the cheap three digit locks are also good. And invisible ink and in, in flashlights. Oh, that's such a key thing. They get so excited about it. Um, so this is just an example of one of my, like the first ones, escape room. This will be in the resource. Um, I just put the locks. This was one where they had to unlock one box to get the cassette out. And um, yeah, it's just fun. I, again, just ask us questions later. Um, and then DIY is a big, big thing. And it's another great way to involve teens. I love cardboard. I love, Fre I have this Freddy Fazbear <laughs> that I made out of cardboard. Like it's not the prettiest thing, but um, because we get a lot of book orders, we get a lot of cardboard. I think at some point I got in trouble for how much cardboard <laughs> I was hoarding, but it really is great to kind of see what supplies we have on hand already at the library. I needed to make a skull. And I had a plastic jug and cardboard and masking. And, and then my coworker gave me his old pool noodle. So it's just amazing what you can do. Teens that love painting. Uh, here's a teen helping me paint a backdrop for, can you recognize it? Bonus points if you do. Leave a comment down below. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, just it, if you love DIY and all of this or involving teens in it, definitely recommend escape rooms. They're the best. Um, and I know we like target teens and middle graders, but this is a program for literally all ages. Um, tweens, teens, young adults, adults, families, children, like college students coming in here. That's amazing. Um, and people have a lot of fun. And I get comments at the end saying like, I didn't think that was going to be as fun as it was. It's, it's really awesome. And uh, I just love seeing them work together um, and have fun. And for our escape rooms, we do require registration um, and it works best for us. So what I do is uh, have a bit.ly link that links to a Google doc and it like shows what times are available. I do try and mark off my lunchtime and when I go to circulation desk and sometimes I'll ask, you know, my bosses if I'm, if I can stay later or longer on the weekends and um, just take time off during the week. But these are some of the frequent, frequently asked questions. Like, do I have to know about the show movie book? No, no. The puzzles, I like, we try and make it 
where it can be solved by anybody. Um, and then the theme is just for for us and the and the and the people participating in the room to get excited about. And also the theme, it's awesome because when when we did the Avatar Last Airbender one, we made like a hot air balloon and I forgot what other props, then we made these other props and the more props you make, the better for the room because people will think that it links to the puzzles and locks. And it's funny, sometimes someone being a huge fan of a show or a movie hinders them in the escape room because they think everything has to do. It's just a lot. It's fun to mess with them though. And then how many people in the group? Two to six is the recommended size. Um, anything bigger than that. And then not everyone's going to get a chance to uh, work on a lock or on a puzzle. And if only one person does it. That kind of defeats the purpose. Yeah. It's like, we want you to work together. And But I have had people do it by themselves and they ended up having fun. But it, it you try and encourage them to come in a group. Um, 13 and over, go for it. Go wild in there. Just, just do your very best. Um, I do recommend like 12 and younger come with an adult or an older sibling or cousin just so someone can kind of make sure there's no arguing or fighting going on. Because sometimes I feel awkward. Like, because... I create stressful situations and they end up kind of, you know, yelling. And so um, hopefully there's an adult who can navigate that. Um, usually it takes about 30 minutes. Um, you can make it shorter or longer. Um, I do try and give them extra time if I am feeling generous that day. But also if you have back-to-back -back escape rooms, um, I have I have made like three little girls cry because they didn't finish the room. And then I talked to the parent, like, is it okay that they didn't succeed? And the parents saw it as a good like learning thing. And um, it was just really nice. Also seeing older siblings working with the younger, younger siblings. And is it free? That's like a big one we get a lot. And yes, it's free because we're your local library. Um, <laughs> and now, and yes, and if you have questions, please, again, reach out to both of us at the end. But now, now we're what libraries are mostly known for, which is the books. So yes. here's some of our book recommendations for the middle grade and the teens. So starting off with middle grade, I, I meant to title this middle grade series. That's my fault. But here's some series I recommend. Some of these you are like does, like Wings of Fire. It's about a war amongst these seven dragon tribes over some lost ancient treasure. It's about dragons. They're awesome. And also, I love the fact that throughout the series, they try to resolve conflicts about war through peaceful means. I think that's a great lesson to impart amongst your middle graders. And also... There's also a graphic novel series for Wings of Fire. So if you have your readers that aren't big chapter book readers, the graphic novels are a great way to go. As we know, graphic novels are a great gateway into lifelong reading. Another series that I highly recommend is The Wing Feather Saga by Andrew Peterson. This is a hilarious book. The first book is called On the Edge of the Dark Sea of Darkness, and that sort of humor continues. And it's a book about a boy and his family that discover a family secret that may awaken an ancient power and they have to stop it. It's very fantasy. If you have fantasy readers, they'll very much enjoy it. Another one that I highly recommend is Momo Arashima Steals the Sword of the Wind. That's the first book, but it's the Momo Arashima series by uh, Misa Segria. And it's about it, it fo focuses on the Shinto religion and this 12-year-old girl is set out to save her Shinto goddess mother. And she has to face demons that are intent on bringing chaos to the world. And so the fate of the world, as most middle grade series, lies on a 12-year-old's back. So no stress, no pressure. And then another series I highly recommend is Winston Chu, the Winston Chu series by Stacey Lee. And it is a modern reimagining of Chinese folk tales. And it's focused on Winston Chu, and he goes to a shop of curiosity, stops a robbery, and it gets granted this magical broom that might bring more chaos and cur might be more of a curse than a blessing. Other great middle grade series that I highly recommend, so you've probably seen this one, Keeper of the Lost Cities series by Shannon Messenger. The books are like this thick, but my middle graders love them. They will read every book. There's a million books in the series right now I think it's still going and it's the basic premise is there's this 12 year old girl Sophie that can read minds she thinks she thinks she's the only one that could read minds so she keeps it a secret until she encounters another boy or a boy named Fitz who can also read minds and the series goes from there it's such a big scope fantasy series that I think is perfect for middle graders another series I highly recommend is City Spies and this is by James Ponty 
and essentially have five kids that are training to be spies, they're spies in training, that they go all over the world to hone in their spy skills. And it's just really cool to see the different locations they go to and how they use their spy skills mm -hmm. to, sit, to like stop heists or do heists. It's really cool. Mm -hmm. Another series I recommend that are for like the lower end of the middle grade. However, I like to encourage reading no matter what reading level you are. Um, Dragon Girls, the, the Dragon Girls series by Maddie Mara. It's about these girls that have dragon lineage that they don't even know about until they just turn into dragons and then they go into this fantasy world with this fantasy adventure. They're very short, but they're so fun. They're like bite-sized bits of adventure. And if you have more middle graders that are struggling readers, especially your girls, highly recommend that series. And then of course we have a Minecraft series. Um, there are so many Minecraft series novels. The one I'm specifically going to recommend is Minecraft The Island by Max Brooks, who wrote World War Z. So big time writer writing in a big time franchise. <laughs> and this series is based on the um, this castaway who washes up on a deserted island in the Minecraft world and has to learn about this island and its secrets to get away. So, and then some more standalone um, middle grade books that I highly recommend. Mm -hmm. The Lost Library, this is by Rebecca Steed and Wendy Mass. And a mysterious little library appears in this town overnight. And we have our character Evan that takes two books from the from the little library and realizes the book titles are weird. And then it, it just spirals on from there into this big mystery. And they go on an adventure, it's super cool. Another one is The Last Grand Adventure by Rebecca Behrens. And for this one, Bay finds her, or Bo, I believe Bay or Bo, I think both are acceptable pronunciations for her name in the book. Um, they find her, She finds herself on a unique road trip with her grandmother in search of her grandmother's long lost sister, Amelia Earhart. So it's like super strange, but super magical. It's a wonderful adventure. I really like it. Another one I highly recommend is Pax by Sarah Pennypacker. And it's drawn, the, all the illustrations in the book are by John Classen. His illustrations are amazing. I love all of his illustrated books. And this one is about a boy named Peter and a fox named Pax. Peter saved Pax as a little fox kit. And then after years and years of developing a friendship together, Peter's father forces him to put Pax in the woods and move 300 miles away. So we have these two friends that miss each other so much. And Peter decides he's going to go back to get his fox friend. So he sets on an adventure by himself to go 300 miles to save his fox friend. And this does eventually, I think the next book in the series does come out soon, but even as a standalone, it was amazing. And then I love this book, Once There Was by Kiyosh Monsef. And it's about a girl who learns after her father dies that her father wasn't just an ordinary vet, but he was a vet to mythical creatures. So she goes on adventures to see what his job was, what his life was. And it's such a cute or a great testament to not only her father's legacy, but also learning her own, her own interests and kind of falling into her father's footsteps. So middle grade standalone books that I highly recommend. And I kind of centered this one on road trips because I feel like that's such integral to our summer reading theme. We have When I Hit the Road by Nancy Cavanaugh. And Essentially, Samantha, our main girl, is not very happy about the idea of spending her entire summer with her grandmother, but the longer she's with her grandmother, they have this these fantastic adventures, not fantasy related, but more like getting to know each other, including competing in a seniors have got talent karaoke competition. It's so funny. I love it. It's very, very delightful read. The next book is The Courage Test by James Preller, and we have Will, who's not very happy about being dragged on a road trip but with his dad to embark and follow the Lewis and Clark Trail. His father is a history professor, so it lines up with his interests. But the more Will interacts with his father, he learns that his father has a terminal illness. And so we learn about more about their relationship and how they're proceeding on that while they're on this grandiose adventure. Another book I highly recommend is Breathing Underwater by Sarah Allen. So we have these two sisters that are going to dig up the time capsule they left, I believe, three years ago at their favorite beach. However, in the three years between the time capsule, them burying the time capsule and them retrieving the time capsule, um, Olivia's older sister, Ruth, 
is suffering with major depression. And so the only thing that Olivia wants to do during this road trip and during the unearthing of the time capsule is to make her sister smile one more time and to capture that. So I thought it was such an emotional testament to sisters, a sister's bond. And especially I thought it was a great portrayal in a middle grade novel of someone with depression. Mm -hmm. The last one I recommend, or at least in the standalones, is Wrong Way Summer by Heidi Lang. And this one is about a family that was abandoned by their mother. Um, that family's father takes, scoops them up and puts them in a van and they become van life people. And they're going on this journey. And essentially it chronicles the older sister in the family, Claire, who learns more about why her mother abandoned their family and really talks about that family dynamic between like an unlikely single father with her, his two daughters. Mm -hmm. And then last but definitely not least, I have middle grade graphic novel suggestions. If your library is anything like my library, graphic novels fly off the shelves. And it's, again, to me, it's a great gateway into any sort of reading. You hook them with graphic novels, they're set. So the first one is The Bad Guys by Aaron Blabley. I'm sure you've heard of it. It is about a group of a group called the bad guys that tries to convince the world that they're not bad guys and they try to perform good deeds to change society's perception of them. The next one I recommend is Amulet and that is by Kazu Kibushi and it's a great graphic novel series. It's a high fantasy where Emily discovers a sentient and autonomous like amulet in her great grandfather's house. And then she's just whisked away into a magical world where she is tasked with protecting this world from someone called the Elf King. I thought it was super fantastic. And really the illustrations are great world building and storytelling. The next one, probably my personal favorite is called The Cardboard Kingdom by Chad Sell. And it's um, also a series. And this is just neighborhood kids that come together, take cardboard like Daisy does, mixes and mashes it and just creates their own world and costumes. And, and it's awesome because they're not just creating fantasies together. They're also building their own identities and learning about themselves through this fantasy role play. And if you like the SpongeBob episode with the box with imagination, you'll, you'll love this one. It's, it's perfect. It's very reminiscent of childhood. Last but not least, um, while this is a series called Smiles, I thought the sisters uh, book in it in that series by uh, Raina Tel Telgimer, I believe I'm saying it right, I believe this was perfect for this theme. So this series follows this author, pretty autobiographical, uh, where she talks about a road trip her and her sister have to um, have, where they're stuck in a car together for three weeks with their new baby brother, and they have to learn how to live together. And again, it's just so funny. I love all of her graphic novels, but I thought this encapsulated the feeling of our theme the most. So without further ado, let's talk about YA titles. Yeah, so a big thing I think was important um, when I first did summer reading, I thought I had to follow things exactly or to a T, but I feel like themes can also just be what's it called? Shape to what, how you want it, how you want the library to be. And so I think... For example, nonfiction books, YA nonfiction books, there's a ton out there. I would recommend for you to just look through and uh, what your collection, what you already have and see, oh my gosh, not like it doesn't have to be adventure specific, but anything could be an adventure really because books, I think this is going to be the best theme ever to try and recommend books to because every book is an adventure. Mm -hmm. So I would just recommend looking through like your nonfiction, your graphic novels and seeing things in your fiction what could entice a teen to read and so I always just like to I would like to read this so um here's just some recommendations I have and again you don't have to have them on your displays or anything like that but the displays are going to be fun this year yeah. this summer because it's just so ah so so great and so like earlier when I talked about cultures and important for teens to be exposed to different uh, walks of life and everything like that. I personally like to do that with books as well. Um, I think it's a good way for um, teens to dive into lives and um, situations that, yes, they could relate to, but also that kind of puts things into perspective and makes them more aware of what's outside of the United States. I um, guess that's something I was blessed with that I have family outside of the United States. And I know teens that come in, they talk about their families and their experiences. They like wish 
that their you know peers could also have those experiences you know and so books are a great way to do that and so snow globe by so young park that one's um it's what a ride i'm just gonna read the comment what a ride it's an immersive and utterly addictive dark dystopian thriller that takes reader deep into the introspection about what you'd be willing to do who do you be willing to become to get what you want with the eerie desperate and exhilarating uh vibes of snowpiercer and the hunger games it's one of the best young adult sci-fi books out there so that's like a comment but obviously teens are going to decide that for themselves um blood at the root um i was just trying to involve books that have like this is a extensive world building incorporates west african caribbean and black american history and cultures to explain a magical reality hidden from you and relevant to the black diaspora and malik's family history it's just i love books that are going to show new perspectives um instead our side I personally never knew how to say it. You know how when you read, you just say something in your head. Um, it's just a dystopian, but at the end, it just kind of makes you question. I don't know. I think it's a good one for teens, for themselves to figure out how the book makes them feel and how they look at the world and society. Um, and then this one, oh, I'm not saying the titles. When the Angels Left the Old Country by Sasha Lamb, um, Uriel the Angel and Little Ash, short for Ashmedai, are the only two supernatural creatures in their shuttle, which is so tiny, doesn't have a name other than shuttle. And the angel and the demon have been studying together for centuries, but pogroms and the search for a new life have drawn all the young people from their village to America. When one of those young immigrants goes missing, Uriel and Little Ash set off to find her. Again, just a book that's going to take you to different parts of the world. Um, the Fox Maidens by Robin Ha. Um, Kai Song dreams of being a warrior. She wants to follow in the footsteps of her beloved father, the commander of the Royal Legion. But while her father believes in Kai and trains her in martial arts, their society isn't ready for a girl warrior. Um, Talessa, <laughs> Talessa by Lani Went Young. Um, so a land of secrets, a girl on fire, an epic battle of the elements. Can love truly conquer all? A thrilling love story inspired by Pacific mythology, featuring a sinister sisterhood with an environmental agenda and a fiery yet vulnerable young woman who must master her gifts before they destroy her and all that those she cares about. So it's just she's trying to discover her family history and what's going on with like her grandmother and mom. And um, it's just another another way to get teens to other parts of the world. Um, Patron Saints of Nothing by Randy Rebay. Um, he, Jay Reguero plans to spend the last semester of his senior year playing video games before heading to the University of Michigan in the fall. But when he discovers that his Filipino cousin, Jun, was murdered as part of President Duterte's war on, war on drugs and no one in the family wants to talk about what happened, Jay travels to the Philippines hoping to uncover um, what happened to Jun and the sides that led to his death. And Jay is forced to reckon with the many sides of his cousin before he can face with the horrible truth and the part he played in it. Um, yeah, that one was, again, it's just, you decide what's best for your teens and what they would like. Um, I just like challenging teens to kind of read stories um, from other perspectives. And especially like, as long as the lemon tree grows, by Zulfa Katu. Uh, Salama Kassab was a pharmacy student when she, the cries for freedom broke out in Syria. She still had parents and her big brother. She still had her home. She was even supposed to be meeting a boy to talk about marriage. Now Salama volunteers at a hospital at homes, helping the wounded who fled through the doors. And I think time relevant with the wars and stuff that goes on in, in the world. It's just a beautiful story and it may be a tearjerker. Um, and Abuela Don't Forget Me by Rex Ogle. An award-winning memoir, Free Lunch, Rex Ogle's Abuela features a source of love and support. In this companion and verse, Rex captures and celebrates the powerful presence of a woman he could always count on to give him warm hugs and ear kisses, to teach him precious words in Spanish, to bring him to the library where he could take out as many books as he wanted, and to offer safety when doctors darkness closed in. Throughout a coming of age marked by violence and dysfunction, Abuela's red, red brick house in Al Abilene, Texas, offered Rex the possibility of home and Abuela herself the possibility for a better life. Um, and so, yeah, those are just books that I would recommend just looking into and seeing if it's something you want to offer in your display. But I just, we just encourage you to please look at books that you think would pull them in all kinds of places, no matter the genre go on their own adventures yeah so, and so that's the end of our presentation thank you guys so much for watching if you guys have any questions concerning mm -hmm. the programs we talked about 
questions about my cat? I don't know. Or, or Leo, <laughs> Leo and Messi. Uh, you can email us at the emails on the screen. And we had such a great time mm-hmm. doing this. And we're so excited for summer reading. So best and, of luck. Yeah. Best of luck with everything. And you got this. Thanks for watching. Bye. Bye.